All right. Yeah, let's swap that out. Thank you so much, you guys. I told you not to expect more uh, illustrations, physical illustrations from me, and, and here I am resetting expectations and making up new rules. So we're going to try to make this work today. Uh, we are in 2 Corinthians, so good to see you guys. As we continue our series, chapter 4 is where we're at today. Chapter 4, um, I'm going to be primarily looking at verses 7 through 18, but we're going to capture some verses prior and after because there's a lot of context we need to cover um, uh, today. So we're going to continue um, in 2 Corinthians. But before, um, be before we go into the passage, before we start to uh, break down the text, um, I, I want to I put you in the, in the seat of and really make sure we understand our audience, right? Really make sure we, we come together with who, the Corinth who Paul is writing to, the Corinthians themselves, and under understand the, the, the context of why Paul is writing, why he's writing, because that'll help us understand the passage better, right, fundamentally. So imagine a small, just a casual conversation. You are in Corinth. You are that Corinthian person, member of the Church of Corinth, a small group of believers out there in, a, in the Las Vegas of, um, of, of Greece, if you will, in the Vegas of Greece, and you're having a small, informal conversation with Paul. And the context of your life is, yeah, you've got, the kids that you've got now, you've got, right? Or if you're going to school, you're going to school. Whatever it is in your life, you're dealing with that. But you've been kicked out of your synagogue because you've chosen to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, or you've been kicked out of the Greek temple, whichever one that you really frequented, because now you associate with these followers of the way, right? Your business you know, it doesn't have the same customers. Your regulars kind of are avoiding you now because it's weird. You're rejected by your extended family who wants nothing to do with you and this new belief system you've taken on. You're afraid for your kids, you know. You're, 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 you know we can figure things out. We're adults. We can manage that. But you're really afraid for your kids who are going to school and they're coming back crying in tears with a black eye because the other kids are bullying them because of the decisions that you made as a family. And so as, as you have the sit down with Paul, imagine he's right there as I'm sure the Corinthians desperately remember. They wanted him to come. They wanted to talk it out. And then the question that they maybe wrote to him of and how you would address him and saying, Paul, it is tough. It is, it is tough. It feels like we're constantly struggling. We're struggling against sin within the church, which Paul has addressed, and we've been trying to address, Paul, we've been listening to your letters. But it's also struggling against sin from the outside and the temptations of living in, in Vegas, if you will, right? And then just the pressure of this world and how they are just... Uh, attacking us in, in, in our businesses, in our lives, in our families, our kids, school, everywhere, right? It's so difficult. Paul, I don't understand. Why do we, who follow Jesus, who follow a God who can make anything possible, why do we who follow the truth, the only truth, why is it that we still suffer so much? Why does God's glory and power that he's promised to each one of us, why is it not more manifest in our life in a way to make living just a little easier and not so difficult? Why is it that God, who's real, all-knowing, but just still loves me, lets me get sick, and why my, my loved ones may die. Um, uh, my, my faith is seen as weakness, and sin is a daily battle. Why is it that he gives us this glorious gospel, and yet my life still seems so difficult? I still feel like I'm an ordinary human, even though I'm empowered with an extraordinary gospel. I think Paul would say something like this. He says, hey, Believer, friend, I've suffered too. Probably more than you, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I've, 
I've seen and God's revealed to me through times where I've been in prison. When I've been in the hospital in the emergency room, they drag me in off the street. When I've seen my friends killed for sport right in front of me, and what God's shown me through that, friend, is that you are like a clay vessel. That you are like, we are all like a clay vessel. How crazy is it that God would take, as he says in the previous verses, and put his light, his immense treasure, extraordinary truth within us as clay vessels to carry that to the world. You guys can't see it, but it's a light in there. He's chosen us, ordinary humans, each and every one of you. We're all common clay. We're all made of the same thing this picture is. It's just dirt. But he's chosen you and I to carry an extraordinary gospel Before we go too much further into this text, I want to make sure we set up the passage and the greater analogy that Paul is carrying. So verse 7, we're going to start here, and then we're going to go into some of the other passages. But verse 7, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. When he talks about treasure... I just want to be clear. He mentions that earlier in verse six. Verse six, he says, "For God, who said, 'Let light shine out of darkness,' had shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God." If you have your Bibles, you can underline that and point an arrow down to treasure the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is the treasure. That is the light that we see in here. That is the treasure ultimately all of us carry. And obviously the jars of clay, the analogy here being us. And if you see here, I think I've got a picture. This was fairly common. So when Paul talks about this, they still today find amphora, jars of clay, all over the Middle East and even going into basically wherever Rome was, they would find, this was just found in Italy three years ago, a jar of clay, very similar to this one, um, full of gold coins. So you didn't have a bank. They did have some banks, but usually what you would do is you would pack this into this jar of clay. You knew it was solid. It would protect it from the dirt. And you would go bury it somewhere where nobody would know until, you know, then this guy maybe died in a war or something happened. And then 3,000 years or 2,000 years later, some guy just dug it up. How cool is that? Um, All that gold, right? How much is that jar worth, do you guys think? Not a lot. How much would you give me for this if you saw it at Goodwill? $2? $2? You're a bargain hunter. <laughs> I'll give you one fifty, and that's my final offer. Um, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't give me a lot. How much would you give me for the gold? <laughs> Nobody knows. You guys aren't appraisers here. But, man, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a million dollars. Maybe it's more or less. That's where the value lies. Why would God choose to take something as fragile as this jar of clay to protect something as valuable as millions of dollars worth of gold coins? That's the question we ask, and that's the question being asked of Paul. Why is it we as ordinary people, why God's entrusted us with something extraordinary, why it seems like such a responsibility, and where is the benefit for me? If we look at ourselves, I just want to be like, just, just let's address our human condition. We are that clay, right? We physically fail. Our bodies and minds are, if we can go next slide, our bodies and minds are easily blo- broken, often overwhelmed. We get sick, we degrade, we suffer physically and mentally. Just like this jar, this was in the news a couple of weeks ago, boy accidentally smashes a 3,500-year-old jar at a museum in Haifa, Israel. By accident. Folks, some of you will die if you eat a peanut. (laughs) By accident. That's your jars of clay. Some of you can't drink a drop of milk, and you know what happens. 
right? That is our bodies. We're, we're, we just have the strangest things that just, we are always sick, right? Honestly, if it wasn't for God-given intelligence, the lions would have eaten us a long time ago. The Lord keeps us around. Um, you guys know, you, you, just, you, you go online, you start to Google symptoms, and you're like, don't let it be cancer. At any point, you're like, please don't let my body die from sickness, right? And it's, I remember, I think I've shared this story before where I was sitting in high school, just in the middle of some class, just trying not to fall asleep, and then my lung collapses, doing nothing. Literally, you could just be sitting here, and all of a sudden, you're trying not to die, right? That is your body. That is why you've heard like Theranos and, and Elizabeth Holmes, where people are paying big money. They want to believe that there's something out there that can give you the answer to all the sicknesses you've got, so you can finally go heal yourself. That's our body. That's the jars of clay we deal with. We're physically frail. We're corrupted by sin. We're prone to pride, faithlessness, greed, fear, jealousy, disobedience, rebellion. Our bodies are corrupt within Every little success that God gives man, we claim for ourselves, and our pride grows and grows. Gluttony, laziness, lust, apathy. You know, and there's on one side folks that live for it, that they desire that, they glory in it, and then there's others that are exhausted by it. I mean, there's moments where you just, you just break down. I don't know about you guys, but you're, sometimes you're just like, oh, Lord, Please come, like this is so exhausting, living in this world, having to deal with it, having that battle constantly coming and saying, Lord, I wanna do what you want, the things I wanna do, I don't do, the things I don't wanna do, I do. Help me stop making dumb decisions. And ultimately, our clay beings will be dead. They will break down, they will shatter. You know, we are cognizant, all of us, of our m mortality, every one of us, especially as you get older. I've never thought about death so much as I do now, especially thinking about, you know, what's going to happen to my kids, my family. You start to put your will together. You didn't do that as a teenager, but you're doing it now. You're thinking about it, right? Um, we had an, uh, just, just the way it hits you. We had uh, a friend of mine who's a landscaper, you know, just a couple of months ago came over told me all about how I'm growing my grass wrong. He was going to come back, give me a quote to fix everything. Never calls me back. On Sunday, I hear that he's passed away in an accident. Guy was in his 40s. Just like that, the vessel is shattered. What about all the babies that die in their sleep? All the GoFundMes you see right now, I mean, you've seen, probably this week, Already, you've seen one or two. Somebody passed from cancer or somebody is dying. Please, let's, let's gather some money to help them. This is such a fragile vessel. You are such a fragile, fragile vessel. And ultimately, we will die. You will, the, your demise is coming sooner or later. And so why would the Lord use something fragile like you, an ordinary person like me, all of us here, to carry an extraordinary gospel. Why not angels? Why not just make some men just like, that's it, you're dedicated and you carry the gospel for us. Why me? Ask yourself that today, because it's about you. Why me? God empowers ordinary humans to carry an extraordinary gospel for three reasons. Our frailty necessitates our reliance. Our frailty better exhibits Christ, and our frailty leads to death and then eternal glory. All of these are necessary things, and God intentionally making us be clay vessels. He created us this way in order to have to give him the glory through these three points. And so the first point here, our frailty necessitates our reliance. Verse seven, verse seven, he says, to show that the surpassing power belongs to who? To God, not you. 
Not me, not us, he says. Not me, Paul says, but all power belongs to God. Those of you that have been following the news lately um, have heard, I think this is within the last year, I don't even remember when, the news cycle was so quick, um, about the billionaires that decided to go down and see the Titanic on the submarine. You guys remember that? And what happened? Say again. They found God. They found God. <laughs> yeah, they, they did. In a split second, in a split second, the Summersville, Summer, Summersville? It was in submarine. It was like a submersible. That's how we pronounce it. Thank you. So the submersible became nothing. It was just, they vaporized, right? The pressure was so much, they couldn't, the, the, the hull couldn't contain it. They disappeared in a second. It imploded. It imploded. The pressure outside was too much, and there was no pressure from the inside to match it. Folks, as this vessel, you have a choice. You have a choice. You can let the pressure crush you. You can let the water rush in, and then the pressure inside is the same as, as the outside. You can take this thing, throw it. The, the reason the Titanic hasn't imploded is because it's let all the water in. It's doing just fine where it is. Or you can allow the pressure within, that treasure that is within, God's light that is within to exert more than enough pressure to push back on all that is trying to harm you, all that is trying to enter your life. Have you seen anybody implode in your life? Think about maybe some of the stories where somebody couldn't take it anymore or, or people slowly letting the world drift in. Maybe it was a friend that, you know, started doing drugs, and then it was just a bad batch, and it got him. Maybe it was a woman that um, fell in with, with the wrong man, just made some bad decisions, left her family. Maybe it was somebody who, a college student that went to college and let it all sink in. I've been there before. Man, you've got to have the light in you to fight that. Slowly, slowly, the waves break at your door to be let in. As God said to Cain, sin is at your door. Will you match it? Will the pressure inside of you be strong to push back to keep the vessel whole so that it may fulfill its purpose? You can't do it by yourself. You'll be crushed. But with Christ, he says this, verse 8, read, read with me. He says, we are afflicted in every way. This vessel is being beat up in every way, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. Struck down. They take this thing and throw it on the ground, but it's not destroyed by some miracle, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Folks, nothing about you makes you particularly suitable for this job. That is why we ask that question and say, Lord, why me? Why me? I'm an ordinary human. Why do you give me an extraordinary gospel? If you were to put your, if I gave you that, that picture of a, just a million dollars worth of coins, would you put it in a jar of clay? Like, where would you put it? In a safe? Somewhere, like, and you would never tell anyone. You'd lock it up. You'd put it in something that's secure, that takes hours to break in. We had um, a safe that we discovered at our house when we moved in, um, and uh, it was closed, and I wanted to get it open. So uh, I called the local safe company, and they're like, yeah, we charge $200 an hour, and we don't know how many hours it'll take to cut it open. I was like, ah, it's still there. It's still closed. Um, if you guys want to try come spin the dial, feel free. Um, I don't know what's in there. But that's what you would do. You would lock it away. You would, you would do something where you know that you can protect it. You don't put it in a jar of clay. This takes me two seconds to open. I can get it out right away. So why, God, we're not particularly suitable for this? 
But yet Christ intentionally takes common people with common problems, with everyday weaknesses, everyday questions, and fills them with the light of the gospel. We don't have superhuman reasoning or strength or incredible resilience or wealth or knowledge or abilities. We all make the dumbest decisions on a daily basis. I know my weaknesses. I'm pained that I can't serve God better, and yet he still chooses to put his light in me. He chose you knowing the challenges, the frailty, the weakness of your clay vessel. And nothing about us makes us worthy to carry it. He pours that treasure in us even though we're nothing special, right? If I take this, if, let's imagine this thing was full of the gold coins. The light is the, is the treasure here, right? And I, I scuffed it up, right? Would you give me less than a million dollars for it? Would you like, oh, now I'm only going to give you 950000 No. The price would be exactly the same. I could beat this thing up as much as I wanted to, and the offer would still be the same. Why? Because it's not about the vessel. It's about the treasure inside. The same way, folks, for us, it's when that treasure is in us. Our entire life receives eternal value. We carry that within us. Our entire strength is Christ, and that is why he chose you, ordinary you, common clay, to carry something supernatural and eternal, something extraordinary. Our application today is simple. Do you just feel wiped out today? Exhausted? Overwhelmed? Are you painfully aware of your weaknesses? As a father, as a mother, as an employee, as a business owner, as a student, as a friend, as a partner? Do you maybe feel that you're not particularly valued? Folks, that is all natural for us to be aware that we are clay, to be aware that we are common ground. And yet, through all of that, we don't let that fact be our identity. We don't come around and say, oh, I'm just clay. Yes, we are, but we say, I am the bearer of the light of Christ. The treasure that is inside of me, I will pass on to my kids. The treasure that is inside of me, I will pass on to my coworkers. The treasure that is inside of me, I will pass on to those around me. And that is why he's chosen you, so that you may carry that light and fill other clay vessels with it as well. And so, first of all, our frailty necessitates our reliance. We have to rely on him because we ourselves have nothing of value to offer. Secondly, our frailty better exhibits Christ. Verse 10, let's read that again. He says, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. We want to imitate Christ even as he was the, the, killed and suffered and tortured right in the body. We also try to pursue him. We also carry that life that he had. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. We see ourselves as jars of clay, just as Jesus became clay, dirt, sentient dirt, <laughs> in order to be like us. So he could be here as an ordinary human, frail in every same way as we are. Christ didn't come down as a demigod as a superhero, as a superpowered angel. He didn't come down with special abilities beyond just the ability to say, Lord God, by your power, let this happen. He came down as common clay. He came as a vessel of clay filled with the light of the gospel to spread it to other clay vessels, filled with treasure that he would share with others. And when that vessel that was Christ's body, you can take, imagine this, and it was just smashed 
right? Just dropped. I'm not going to do that. This is Anna's. Uh, <laughs> but imagine when it was smashed, what was inside was revealed. That treasure, that candle, right? It was revealed fully, just like we saw when that clay pot was smashed. That gold came to light. It didn't become less valuable. It just became more apparent to people what was inside. The fullness of the gospel, the fullness of grace was finally revealed. It reminds us of an Old Testament story. We already heard it this morning. Pastor Eeyore preached on it of Gideon, right? Right? What did they do? They had the clay jars, Right? And what do they have inside? Somebody said it. You can't answer every question, Anatoly. Give the rest of the people a chance. What do they have inside? Somebody say it loud. Thank you. They had the fire. They had light in there. Absolutely. And so when they smashed it, right, the people didn't run away. The Midianites didn't run because... Oh, they had clay pots. No, anybody could have. The, the, the boy smashed the clay pot. It's simple. It's, it makes you weak. But when it was smashed and the light was produced, that is when the Midianites ran. They panicked. They began to kill each other. It wasn't the sword. It wasn't their spears. It was the light. And so that is why we go back. Remember verse 3 of 2 Corinthians uh, to give you the context for that treasure. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It was veiled to the Midianites, but in their case, uh, uh, verse four, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, right? That light that is the image of God within him, right? They were blinded. The Midianites were blinded like this world is blinded to that light, not seeing it, choosing not to see it, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We don't go around telling people how to be a better clay pot. We don't go around saying, hey, if you just add a handle, if you just have a little lid, if you just you know, go in the oven and they just paint you up a little bit, we don't care about that. That's not what, oh, all of a sudden I'm gonna give you 50 cents more for that gold? That doesn't matter. We go around telling people how to have the life of God in them. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is real power. And so Paul embraces this frailty. He embraces being that clay vessel, common, nothing special, because he knows that the more the container breaks, the more he's beaten. As he's out there on the water struggling to stay afloat in the ocean, as he's there in the den, in the prison, trying to keep it alive, trying to figure out who's going to feed him there as he's there in, in, in the mob of people curled up in a ball while they hit him and beat him and throw stones at him. In that moment, he's thinking, that's fine, break this vessel. Break it, because out of it, treasure will pour out through how I humble myself, through me recognizing that all of this is for Christ. Remember as they saw St uh, uh, Stephen, right, as they were stoning him, and they said his face shone his face was special. They said, this is, this is uncommon. Now the light was being revealed. And so for us to be victorious over sin as humans, to be filled with love to our enemies as ordinary humans, all of that in those moments reveals his power and his light. And so the application here um, is when we feel attacked, when we feel chipped at broken, does our light shine through? Or are we so packed with dirt, <laughs> we just carry so much luggage that that's what comes out? It's that old, I mean, you guys have heard it a million times, but for those two of you maybe that haven't heard it yet, um, the old story of somebody who was, you know, nailing a nail and hit his thumb with the hammer and then a curse word slips out. He says, oh, I'm sorry, that just slipped out. And, and his friend said, no. If it wasn't in you, it wouldn't have slipped out to begin with. It was in your heart to begin with, right? They say to find out who a person really is, see who they are under pressure. When people pick 
at the paint of their life, when people try to break off pieces, when people don't value you for what you think you should be valued, what happens then? What is revealed underneath all of that? Christ didn't see his clay vessel as an excuse. He saw it as an opportunity. He saw it for its true purpose, for what it, he was intended for, the completion of carrying that light, ultimately revealing it to others and letting his body, knowing that ultimately the body is meant to die. Ultimately, it's meant to be broken so that we can more fully reveal Christ to others. Our frailty better exhibits Christ, and our frailty leads to death and then to eternal glory. Ultimately, every vessel will be smashed. It all leads to death, but then there is eternal glory. Read with me verse 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, as we pour it out to others, right, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, more vessels with more light shining in them. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, he says that mildly, as, as I'm getting sick, as I get cancer, as I'm beaten, as I'm rejected, our outer self is wasting away. I'm losing my mind here, but our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light, says the guy that's been dead a couple of times. Momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. Beyond all comparison, as we look not to things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God uses us here in the current mortal condition. He expects us to share the light, right? Continue to share the treasure that is within us. But one day, your clay vessel will crumble some of you sooner than others. So we may be at your funeral. You may be soon at mine. We don't know. The, ve the vessel will crumble. The fine print, you know, there's a promise and there's fine print. The fine print is the crum it'll crumble. The, 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 the promise is that we will be transformed, right? And so as this vessel goes away, we become a different vessel. We become transformed into something that more fully now can exhibit the glory of God. Now there is no longer the clay through which we kind of, okay, maybe we see some as through a veil, through a distance, through a fog, we see Christ in you, friend. But in that moment, the clay falls away and the treasure that was within you this whole time, that light that was within you that whole time, finally is revealed more fully. Folks, that's what makes heaven incredible. Because then we look at each other and we see now all of that human, all that is dead, all that has been dying and decaying that we barely were putting makeup on and drugs into and trying to keep alive, finally we don't have to worry about any more because then the light within you is fully revealed and that is where perfection comes from, right? Paul, um, uh, uh, Paul shares that analogy, he says, of the, of the frail tent in, verse, in chapter 5. He says, um, uh, and Paul being a tent maker, this was obviously close to his heart. He says, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal, uh, 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 eternal in the heavens, right? Um, for in this tense we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. This is in L.A. And you can imagine that tent right there in front. That is us today. But imagine if, if whoever owns that building in the back said, hey, live here for, for a short while. But you have a deed. 
We're preparing for you that skyscraper in the back, if you could go back for just a quick second. That is yours to live in. That is yours to have. It's worth a billion dollars. Don't worry about that, though. It's already taken care of. You have something new to look forward to, but live now currently in this tent. Live now currently in that broken down clay vessel so that soon you will have something more glorious. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Maybe that's you today, you're... You've got some big sighs thinking about, man, life is tough. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why I deserve this. We groan, we're burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is immortal may be swallowed up by life. The mortal goes away and something glorious comes too. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. I'm sure we'll hear more about this probably um, next Sunday when Pastor Peter preaches. I always share the story uh, during baptism classes, um, but uh, there was a, um, uh, uh, a young man, 30 years old pastor that was passing away because uh, he was just so in ministry that he could not, um, uh, just he was dying of exhaustion. And the story he shares at that point on his death, but he said, um, I wanted to deliver the message, but I killed the horse. Right? The message here is don't kill your clay pot intentionally. The Lord will use you as he should, right? I, I'm not saying don't go work out, don't eat healthy. What I'm saying is be, live out the purpose God has created for you. If that means pouring out that light into your children, live it out fully. If that means pouring that light into others around you, live it out fully. Deliver the message. Use your clay vessel for the purpose it was intended for so that as your body is wasting away, you can look out and see other vessels, little one, your kids, your friends, a big ones, be filled with light to carry it on to others. That is how you can have confidence in your future, no matter the momentary affliction. I'll conclude with something that was also in the news just a couple of weeks ago. Um, three weeks ago, September 14th, 2024. I don't know if you guys saw this. For those of you that follow Christian news, this is a pastor in Texas. His name is David Lynn. David Lynn, sorry, he's from California. David Lynn, uh, um, uh, he went to China, went back to China to preach the gospel back in 2006. 20 years ago, uh, 18 years ago, 2006, he went back to China to preach the gospel. After about, I mean, he had kids here, he had a family, and he says, my, the, what God wants me to do, the purpose of my clay vessel is to go preach. And so he goes, two years later there, he gets put in prison by the Chinese government. Imprisoned for um, holding church, which wasn't sanctioned right now in China. They're you know, taking down pictures of Jesus, they're rewriting the Bible. And so he was put in, put in prison. When his family reached out to him and said, hey, should we petition the state government to try to get you out? What do you want us to do? He says, it's actually all right. I'm starting a Bible study group here. I'm translating the Bible into a modern version of Mandarin. Um, just pray that the Lord use me here. And he was there from 2008 until just recently when um, things got much worse. His health deteriorated. He lost a lot of his teeth. I know he looks good in this picture on the right. But finally he said, no, I, I think if you can, see if the U.S. government can get me out. And they just released him three weeks ago. Folks, this man lost near 20 years of his life in prison. He never got to see his grandkids be born, grow up. He never got to see his kids graduate college. He missed large portions of their life. He wasn't involved. He couldn't while he was imprisoned. But he recognized his purpose, that clay vessel, was to be there to spread the truth wherever he was, even in prison. That was never his plan. But he did it. Folks, as frail as we are, the life of a believer 
is not easy. It's not going to be good for your well-being. Yes, you're exhausted. Yes, you're tired. Yes, you're overwhelmed. And that's exactly why God is using you. You're an ordinary person that carries a glorious, extraordinary gospel. And he wants you in your frailty to lean on him, rely on him. He wants you in your frailty to show others that Christ was frail too, and yet he overcame. And he wants you in your frailty to understand that death awaits, but then there is glory. There is transformation, and that is what we look forward to. Amen? If I could ask you to stand, we're going to have a moment just of silent response. It's communion Sunday today, and as as we prepare our hearts for that moment, we're going to be eating, and Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, this bread, this is that broken clay. It's going to be broken soon, he told his disciples. There will be a moment, and then my new body will be revealed, my new essence will be revealed. Let's think about how we also are broken with him, and ultimately will be transformed as well. He did this for us. This is his mission. This is why we have the light today and within you. And so let us join him and say, Lord, let me carry that light. Let me carry that treasure, no matter how hard it is, for your glory. I'll give you a moment of silent response. Father, we come before you as your children and are astounded again that you would choose us knowing our weaknesses, knowing how exhausted we are, the events of our life right now, the battles we're facing, our weaknesses, our sins, every way we're corruptible, our exhaustion, and yet still you choose us and put within us the light of your gospel. And our purpose is to continue to spread that as as things break down, as, as As our body fades away, may you increase so that we can share it with our families, with our friends, so that we can share it with our coworkers, our employees, our bosses, those that we meet by chance. Never, never chance, always by your will, Lord. May we carry that light. May give us the strength to push back against all that is around us. May we carry that light so we could be like you. And may we carry it into eternity so that when this old piece of clay, when we finally pass away, we can be made new to exemplify you more fully so that your glory be completely revealed in us, fully seen in us. So our sense, our essence may be swallowed up by who you are in us. Be glorified in you alone, Lord. Amen.